We're just very honored. Loudon was one of the first two brands that we brought in. And of course, their guitars are amazing. That's why we brought them in as uh, one of our premier brands. Uh, so we have a fan fret, we have the uh, new thin body, and we have the Wee Loudon with the beautiful sinker redwood, and then the old lady Pierre Ben Susan, which is the uh, largest body shape. Enjoy. So here's George Loudon. Thank you. This design, the larger body, um, was the only design that I had for the first um, probably six, seven years, something like that. And, um, but I had different wood choices, but this was the basic design. I haven't changed it, I haven't changed it since then. It's still the same today in virtually every respect, in terms of the way it's voiced, in terms of the depth, in terms of the, the shape and the size. But when I arrived at this design, which would have been uh, about two and a half, three years after starting, um, uh, a friend of mine who I made a guitar for, unknown to me, he took it round shops in Paris. And all of a sudden, I mean, I'm standing in my workshop and I get a call from my friend who's in Paris and says, George, I'm in this uh, guitar shop in Paris and they want six of your guitars. And I was like, whoa, how am I going to make six or seven guitars? Because it takes me quite a long time. Um, but I did, and I was so excited. I, I think I had only ever been out of the country once before. I was so excited that um, we filled up the back of his, of his mother's little Renault 5, little small car. We filled it up with all the guitar cases when they were eventually made and drove the whole way to Paris and delivered them, so took it to the shop, and they um, took the guitars in, paid me for them right away, and then they wanted, I think it was six a month. So I was, and this was actually the, the best acoustic guitar shop in, in Paris. And so that was the start of the whole. And what year was that, would you say? Uh, that was about 1977, eight in between seven and eight. So you didn't, you weren't apprenticed to someone else? No. I was about 22, 23. Um, I, I, I had bought this little book, very thin little book. I think it's called Build Your Own Folk Guitar. And it's uh, by an English guitar maker uh, called John Bailey. So I spent really the first two years teaching myself how to use tools, how to sharpen tools, um, how to, just how to make a guitar that, in a, in a way that I could kind of look at it and say, well, that looks really good. Um, but it took about two years. First of all, you have to remember, back then there was no internet. There were no uh, literary schools like there are today. Um, and there were very few books, you know, so this was the only one I had. So I had to kind of dig deep, and every mistake I made I had to try and find a way to overcome it. Guitar making is, is, you know, this is the way I like to look at it. Guitar making is, first of all, a tradition. Because, you know, we've had wonderful guitars um, coming from, uh, mostly from America, it has to be said, <laughs> in terms of steel string, um, uh, for what, since 18, whatever 33. it is. 33. 33, there you go. So that's why it's a tradition, because all this, all this, you know, experience of all these guitar makers and small companies has led us to this point where um, if I was to try and make a guitar that didn't draw on that tradition to some extent, then it wouldn't look like a guitar anymore. So it, I, that's why it's first of all a tradition. Even though I've gone my own, paddled my own canoe and gone my own way in many things, it still has to look like a guitar. It still has to have approximately the same string length and so on. Uh, so first of all, it's a tradition, you know, and second of all, it's an art and a craft. And that's, that's the individual maker's stamp that he or she puts on the designs and, and, and the guitars themselves. And that's really important. Um, but the, the, the third thing, it is a science, um, and it's probably in that order. So the key thing is to try and design a guitar, for me, that has power and has sustain, but also has character. And um, that's, what I, that's, what, that's what I really try to do. So it's really important to have 
they, the area of the guitar from the, from the tip of the head to the bridge, very stable, very, um, very stiff, and um, in such a way that the rest of the guitar can be very responsive. And if you get that balance right between making this area very responsive and this area very stable, then you get a lot of power, you get a lot of sustain, uh, particularly sustain. Uh, if you get that wrong and you allow the power to leak away because you've made this part of the guitar a little bit weak, it's a really bad thing. So um, one of the things that I, I did um, way back in 1976, I think, uh, was I designed what's called A-frame bracing. Um, so, so really, let me see, can you see that okay? You see those two struts up at the, up, up at the top there? These two, yeah. Um, those are what, what is now called A-frame bracing. And I came up with the idea way back, uh, say, 1977 or 6. And with these two struts, they actually go right into the dovetail joint and butt joint against the neck of the guitar. And so those struts actually create a lot of stability in this area here. Don't forget the sound hole is the weakest part of the guitar because there's, there's nothing there. So it's really important to have this area very stable. So the A-frame bracing is one of the things that uh, helps to create that stability. The five-piece neck is another thing that helps. Um, a a five-piece or a three-piece laminated neck even is going to be more stable than just a one-piece because the glue lines from the laminations create a lot of extra stiffness. And it's not twisting either. And not twisting either. So this one, this is how we glue the struts on in this rectangular um, uh, profile. And then afterwards, we hand carve them with Japanese chisels uh, to this profile. So if you, you can see they're very, very triangular. So those are all hand carved in place, they're not pre-cut and... No, they're all hand carved in wow. place, yeah. But we do it this way because you're going to get a better joint between the strut and the soundboard if you glue them on rectangular because... Or even pressure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is what people call dolphin profile bracing. So it looks like the back of a dolphin when they're coming out of the water. Yeah, you can have a look. So this uh, dolphin profile, I designed that so that, um, so that I would be able to increase the stiffness in certain parts and keep it very responsive in other parts. This is a piece of material we make struts from and if you look at it carefully you'll see that the top surface and the bottom surface, they're not regular, they're not straight lines. That's because we split, we split the material rather than saw it. So what that means is that the fibers are very long. Ver the, the fibers are parallel to that split, uh, split surface. And then we cut parallel to that so that every individual strut has extremely long fibers. Um, if you, it's, much, it's very time consuming to do it that way. Um, if you saw all the strut materials, you know you can do it very quickly. But I would say 50% of the material you do that way is going to have what we call short grain mm -hmm. because the saw actually doesn't follow the grain, the saw just cuts whatever way you present the wood to the saw. So, but this way you're sure of getting it, um, getting the fibers nice and long. That's really important. And if you, if you look at these, this is um, one, of the, one of the struts for example, you'll see that it's the, the surface there, the gluing surface, is uh, caramelized and that's because we cut those on the laser machine uh, so there's a bit of high-tech lurking in this in this factory of mine now but what we do again which is different to other companies is we take that surface and we hand we plane it by hand every individual strut and that makes a difference as well so we use a plane like that very very set very fine and we actually plane uh, it's actually this surface, and we, we pass the plane over it once or twice on, until it's smooth, it feels 
very, very smooth. Now, if, you, if we had just machined that arch into it, um, the surface has got, uh, it, if you looked at it, you give you and can feel it, it's, it's like corrugated. And that's good enough structurally, but it's not good for transferring sound because the hardwood lines are not actually, they're the low parts of the, of the undulations. Uh, the, the softwood lines are the high parts. That's because the machine compresses the softwood but cuts the hardwood. So this, these, you know, this is a very small thing that we're talking about, you know, hand planing each strut. But if you've got 150, you know, small things, that makes it, that, that can make quite a significant difference. So there are a lot of things we do like that, that are very important. The, the uh, dolphin profile, this dolphin profile bracing is, is absolutely fundamental to what we, to what we do. So really, that's, that's the principle of, of stability, volume, power, sustain. When you start talking about other things like uh, uh, character of tone, uh, it's mostly to do with the wood, um, mostly to do with having enough wood and not, not making the guitar too light. Um, and, and a guitar maker's job, one of his things he has to do is um, make, create a balance between too much wood or too little wood. So uh, too much wood and the guitar will sound like a wardrobe, um, you know, or too little wood and it's liable to be dead in two years time. So the tone character comes from the de a combination of the design, the workmanship and the particular wood choice. So, but the wood is great. I mean, that, that wood gives it a certain clarity, but also warmth as well. Sitka spruce, on the other hand, uh, is, is very good for clarity and definition. Maybe not quite so warm. So if you play, if you play the couple of chords on the LSE for us, Bernie, that'll be great. <laughs> So that's typical Sitka spruce, very nice, but but and very clear. Um, maybe not quite as warm uh, as cedar, for example. You could play play a couple of chords on that. So a slightly um, a slightly warmer sound, and a slightly lighter sound. Um, and this is, this is the fantastic privilege that I have to work with all these woods, you know. This has Cuban mahogany on the back and sides, which is the kind of the ultimate mahogany. Um, you know, one of the things I do is I listen, I listen to what players say to me, and I listen very carefully. And it doesn't matter whether they're famous or not famous, I still listen and try and, uh, the next guitar I make or the next guitar that I design, I try and find ways to improve things. So I've, you've never, I, I haven't arrived, you know, I'm always trying to make things better. I'm totally obsessed with quality and playability. Um, so I hope that the guitars I make in five years time, if I'm still here, are better than what I, what I make now. Which of course makes it difficult to work for me. Yeah. Um, if, <laughs> uh, but I, I have a simple philosophy, if, if the guitars I'm making in five years time are even 1% better than now, then there'll always be a market for what I do. Mm -hmm.